My name is Ji Yang and I'm from Johns Hopkins University. Today I'm here to talk about our work in using cross-modal self-supervised learning to learn a representation of surgical gestures during robot-assisted surgery. The motivation behind this project is to use the signals that are available on during a robotic surgery to learn this um, representation of surgeon actions without directly labeling the uh, surgeon actions. Since the uh, endoscope video and the robot kinematics are readily available in robotic surgeries and are time synchronized, we can use them as self-supervisory signals. The self-supervised learning scheme could uh, be trained throughout a surgery, and thus this representation it learns could adapt to different surgeons, to different surgeries, and different patient setups. While there's a lot of previous work in learning um, to recognize surgical gestures and surgical skill levels, the use of labels make it different, difficult to adapt to new setups. We hypothesized that a self-supervised learning scheme could generalize better to different data sets. Um, so for an experienced surgeon, even if she was not told beforehand what the task is, if she observes a few sutures in the patient's scene, she could probably figure out how to finish this suturing task. We want to create a representation of um, surgical actions for the computer that's as generalizable as that. And so speaking of generalization, one of the challenges in this field is the lack of data sets. Jigsaws is perhaps the most widely used. The left um, image shows an example of the not tying tasks in Jigsaws data set. And we see that this is not very like how we imagine surgeries to be. And we want to make sure that the algorithms we learn are not specific to this setup. And so we add a data pre-processing step of extracting the optical flow and introduce some invariance towards background and uh, illumination. Once we do the data uh, pre-processing, we can start training our network. Here we take 25 frames of optical flow and pass them um, through an encoder decoder network structure. The 25 frames of optical flow are stacked in the feature channel. So if you imagine um, in normal image processing, such as you have in the bottom right corner, the red, green, and blue are stacked in the feature channel. The kernel takes all of them and the outputs for each feature is added together to create the overall output. Similarly, we stack the optical flow channels X and Y in but 25 of them. And so we have a 50 um, long array for our feature channel. And our convolution is over the spatial domain of the images. So we can imagine instead of red, green, and blue, we have um, the X and Y of each of the time steps. The 25 frames gives us about 1.67 seconds of context for each gesture. And so we pass this through the encoder channel through a bottleneck layer where we hope to capture the relevant representation. And then the decoder level reconstructs it um, to match the kinematics. Once we train our encoder and decoder, we can uh, look specifically at the representation that it learns in the, in the um, bottleneck layer. The first way we want to evaluate our algorithm is to visualize it. And we do that using dimensionality reduction with UMAP. Since the labels for skill and gesture are readily available in Jigsaw's data set, we can color the representations um, and the plots by the skill and gestures. And we see that patterns do emerge. On the left plot, which is colored by surgeon skill level, uh, we see that the gestures fall neatly into two clusters for the expert and the novice um, skill levels, whereas intermediate spans between the two. This is in line with previous work that have found that intermediate um, skill level is the hardest to classify. And it sort of makes sense since the um, intermediate are all skill levels in jigsaws are self-identified and you can imagine more or less confident surgeons identifying as intermediate. What's also interesting is that in within each of the skill clusters, we see clusters of based on the gesture being performed. And in the expert cluster, this is slightly more distinct than the novice cluster, which could be due to we have more gestures in novice cluster, or 
um, perhaps experts perform the gestures more consistently. The table on the right identifies each of the gestures. It's not super important right now, um, but what's more important is overall they form this pattern, um, which is interesting because the um, encoder decoder structure has never seen a label during its training. The bottom shows some examples of the various gestures within the not tying, um, just not tying tasks. And on the next slide, we see that um, for suturing tasks, the patterns are similar. The skill level is separate, and within each skill level, we see the gestures forming clusters. One thing to note is that the examples of suturing tasks on the bottom it looks very different than the not tying tasks, even though they share some of the same gestures. And here is one um, example of where um, our hypothesis that the um, self-supervised method could generalize better over these different um, setups could come into play. And lastly, we show the results for the uh, needle passing tasks in Jigsaws. We see that some, um, a few of the gestures here are less distinct, uh, form less distinct clusters, such as uh, the pink and purple, so moving to center with needle and grip and orienting needle. But both of these tasks are single-handed maneuvers of the suturing needle. And so one can imagine that it's harder to distinguish them. So we can visualize these separation. And our next step is to quantify um, and see if we could train um, a classifier to pick up on these separations. And so we train a simple uh, tree-based classifier, XGBoost, to do multi-class um, classification on the gestures and the skill level. And although these results uh, from 60 to 70% accuracy for um, gesture to 48 to 81% accuracy for skill uh, are not quite the um, as good as they of the art supervised learning, we see that the um, classifier does pick up on the separation found in the representation um, through the encoder-decoder network structure. And so although the encoder-decoder network has never seen the label, it has identified how to sort the representations based on what we think um, as semantically meaningful. So that's interesting. One outstanding question we had here is that um, we thought that introducing more examples of gestures would aid in the classification. So if we um, test on not time and compare the performance of an encoder decoder um, structure that was trained just on not time versus trained on all of the tasks, we thought um, having more examples would help it. But that while that's true for not tying, it's not true for needle passing. And so one possible explanation could be that the um, Jigsaw data set have very little intra-class variation. The setups generally have the same um, orientation, same um, camera and instrument alignment, whereas that's not necessarily true between the tasks. And so the network may um, have to generalize more if it has more um, examples from different tasks. Perhaps more intra-class variation uh, would change this uh, balance that we're seeing. And so we also show the confusion matrix for our classifiers. We see that for some um, gestures, it's a lot harder because there is just so few examples. For example, G10 for um, only comes up twice um, after we've done some filtering for the um, searching task. And so that one is very hard to classify. Lastly, um, we wanted to test the generalizability of our representation. And so we um, train our encoder decoder on one task and see what um, the representation would look like if we give it gestures from a new task. We use the task needle passing and not tying since they share very few gestures. The two gestures they do share are artificially introduced by Jigsaw's data set to begin and end each um, data collection. And so on the left plot, it shows the um, UMAP of representations of the not tying tasks in the um, blue, orange, and green color. In black, it shows where needle passing um, gestures would fall in um, if we pass it through the encoder train on not tying and plot it um, using UMAP. 
we see that the new tasks are generally uh, put into the novice category. This sort of makes sense because the novice class represent inherently more variations in how the gestures are being performed, whereas we have, we think that the experts uh, perform the gestures more consistently. And we see similar patterns, though less um, distinctly when we do the reverse and have not tying task pass through the encoded um, trained on needle passing. Again, we would like to quantify the observations and see whether the representation can be used for class training classifiers on tasks that it has never seen before. Turns out um, it can. The accuracies, of course, are a little lower if the encoder decoder structure has not seen the task. But we see that the um, classifier trained on representations um, of a task that was not used in training also does reasonably um, OK, given that it's six to 10 class um, classification problem. And so in conclusion, in this work, we propose a cross-modal self-supervised learning scheme to extract semantically meaningful representations without the use of labels. We see this as a step towards um, forming personalized uh, future prediction for adapting to different uh, surgeons, surgeries, and patient setups and to perform lifelong learning throughout a surgery that could adapt in case this patient conditions change. And since we saw the two distinct skill clusters in our plots, we're also looking at what's driving this difference that the computer is picking up on and whether we can use this to personalize feedback to surgeons and um, sort of teach the novice surgeons to perform at a more expert level. Thank you for listening. <laughs>